I was growing up, I went to church sort of once in a while. Uh, we were sort of cultural Christians, I would say, in my uh, household. We were Christians because we weren't something else, okay? Uh, but we weren't terribly devout. Uh, we went, I, I went to church once in a while. I went to Sunday school every time I went to stay the night with one of my certain cousins. Um, I, my sister and, and mom and I went to a, a little church briefly. I remember just going there a time or two. Uh, we went to Easter uh, very faithfully. Near, nearly every year uh, we went to church on, on Easter. Um, but I don't think I really understood why we do this or what's the importance. Why, do we, why, does, why is this part of our lives? Why do we do this uh, once a year? Um, part of the family lore is that during uh, an Easter service at my grandparents' church, I looked up at my mom and said, why is that man so angry? Uh, he was a very fiery preacher at their church, and uh, he just sounded angry all the time. I hope I don't sound angry, uh, unless I'm preaching an angry passage, okay? And then I want to sound angry, but I hope I don't want to uh, sound angry all the time. And I'm not angry at anybody, okay? So if I, even if I do seem angry someday, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. I'm never mad at you. Um, I heard the, the gospel, though, really for the first time when I was 13. Um, and shortly after that, I started to attend church every week. Um, and I was part of a, a youth group. It wasn't really till I was in youth group that I started to figure out what is a church, what do we do, why are we doing all of this. And I went to a church that had a fairly large youth group. Our youth group leader was also very, very passionate. Uh, she's a very fiery person. Uh, she's, a, she's a pistol. She's a little gal, but a lot of energy uh, coming out of her. Uh, and I just remember being in our youth room, and she's in the front, and she's really, uh, really sharing the gospel with us. She's really giving us good, solid Bible teaching. And then behind us in the back of the room, several of the parents of the teenagers were, were back there. And uh, they, we always felt like, oh, they, they come to our services because it's better than the adult services. But I don't think that that was necessarily true. They were really there. Um, they were there because they wanted to give us all kinds of support. And they were a huge support uh, for us in uh, during that, that time in our life. Um, so we had this person giving us very solid biblical teaching from the front, and we had people supporting us from the back. And those people, they provided us with a lot of um, emotional support. You know, your teen years are very uh, tumultuous years in your life, and they gave us lots of um, uh, helping hands, lots of hugs, lots of shoulders to cry on, lots of ears to, to listen to us drivel on about uh, uh, whatever it was that we thought was so important. Of course, it was important to us at the time. Um, they listened and they supported and they were very good for us. And I hope that we have that here. Um, right now, we have a very small youth group. Um, it's really just three or four people that get together each week. It's on Sunday nights. Um, Hannah is our youth director. She's out getting some R&R R &R this weekend. She, she really has needed it. Uh, if you don't know what's been going on in her life, she, she really needs some, uh, some alone time and some Sabbath. Um, but I hope that, uh, you know, in a few years, you saw what we had up here this morning. We have, uh, in children's story time, we have a pretty good sized group of kids. We've got, um, two, two girls that were up here that really are actually now old enough to be part of the youth group. Uh, and in just a few years, uh, Hannah's group is going to just grow and grow and grow. We had 19 up here. I think 22 is our record. So we had nearly a, we were getting close to our record up here this morning. But as, as they get older, uh, Hannah's going to have a lot a lot of kids to deal with. And I hope that some of uh, the parents of these kids will be in there with her on Sunday nights. Uh, you know, she'll be in the front giving a good, solid Bible teaching. And then right behind, standing uh, or sitting in, in back of them, is, is this other support system of parents, caring people who, uh, who want to, to build up these kids. Well, in our youth group, uh, one of our, our, our youth group leaders' main themes, uh, besides not fornicating, was to use your gifts and talents for the Lord. Okay, we heard those two those two messages all the time. Don't fornicate. Use your gifts and talents for the Lord. Your gifts and talents are there to build up uh, the local church. There was a huge emphasis on that in our church, uh, and I, I feel like it's no it's no uh, coincidence now that a lot of the kids that I was in youth group with are now really pillars of that church. They really become pillars of that church because they were told you are supposed to use your gifts and talents for the Lord right here to build up the local church. And the church is going to need you. And I would say that uh, uh, to all youth, uh, to all young people, um, of course, we dismiss them. But we got a few young people in, in here right now. Um, if you look at the people who are the pillars of this, who, who are the pillars of this church, that's going to be you someday. All right. It may not be as far in the future as you think that that those people, uh, as they retire, as they uh, um get older and older, uh, they're going to need your strength. We're going to need your strength uh, to build up the next generation. Uh, 
All right? So don't think that church is something that our parents do or, or whatever, but they don't ever need me. No, that's not, not true at all. We absolutely have to do a very good job of passing on heritage um, to the next generation because that next generation is, the new, is going to be the new leaders. Uh, so we used our gifts and talents for the Lord, and, and one of the things that our youth group leader did was uh, organize a drama ministry. All right, so we had a lot of we had a lot of drama in our youth group, but we also did a lot of drama in our youth group. And our youth group would often go to other churches. There'd be other churches in our denomination that had uh, very small youth groups or no youth groups, but they wanted to have a youth night, a youth service on a Sunday evening once a month. And so sometimes our church would go to that church and we would do their youth service for them. And they would have a few youth maybe uh, around uh, that, that uh, were, were seeing what we were doing. But we would get up here, there would be some people who sang, there would be some people who did uh, little drama sketches, and there were a group of three or four of us boys that would uh, take turns uh, preaching a little sermon or something like that. And then afterwards, we would dismiss and we'd go have uh, you know ice cream and play basketball, whatever you, uh, you do after a youth service. Um, and, and in that way, in that way, our youth group... Um, really started to see, oh, it's not just us as a local church. You know, the youth group isn't here just to uh, get together and have fun. We're actually here to be a blessing to other people. We were here to bless our church, and we were a blessing, I think, to our church. Uh, but we tried to be a blessing to, to other churches as well. And so we started to, to say, hey, our church is not just our local congregation. The church is much bigger than that. And so we would, uh, uh, we would go around the state, and sometimes we would even go a little, little bit out of state to uh, some of these churches. And we started to see that the church is, hey, it's not just local, it's national. It's, it's not just local, it's national. And then we would even sometimes go to youth rallies or conferences that were sort of national gatherings for our denomination. And even uh, missionaries would come, and they would talk about being missionaries, and they would show pictures of their churches um, all around the world, in Africa and Asia and South America and all these other places. And we started to say, hey, whoa, 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 you know, that was sort of my first exposure. Hey, the church isn't just in Owasso, Oklahoma. It's not just a local congregation. It's not just across the United States. Uh, it's, all, it's all across the world. The church is absolutely everywhere. That's incredible to me. And, I, and at that time, I, was, I really enjoyed geography. I still do. I love geography. And I love world cultures. And I love foreign languages. I took foreign language in high school. I took French in high school. There was not a whole lot of need for French in Oklahoma. A uh, little more need for it in Maine. Not a whole lot of need for it in Oklahoma. But I didn't want to take Spanish. Because uh, everybody takes Spanish. Um, I really think that the Lord had me take French because of the teacher. Uh, it's not that he was a believer or anything like that. He loved language too. And he would he could put a zeal in your heart for learning language and really uh, trying to sort of incarnate yourself as this other other nationality, this other ethnic group, this other kind of person. Uh, he was very good. And and then later, um, all of these things, all of these facts about me and my background sort of coalesced. Uh, you're a Christian. You love the Lord. You love the Word of God. You use your gifts and talents for the Lord. Uh, you're good at foreign language. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of dawned on me, the Lord is training you to be a missionary. The Lord wants you to be a missionary. Uh, Wes, I want you to be a missionary. And that's what I did. Uh, um, uh, some of you may not know very much about me and my background, but uh, Susie and I, were we were uh, foreign missionaries in China. For um, I was there for 11 years. She was there for five years. That's where we met. Uh, and it was great. It was great to see that. It was great to see the world and what God was doing all over the world. Local congregations from uh, little towns in China that you and, and, and in Thailand and other places in South Korea that I went that um, you have no idea that they're there. It's not that you doubt that they're there or anything, but you just have no uh, awareness of what God is doing all around the world. But I, I learned. I saw and I got a glimpse of what God's mission is uh, in the world and what his vision is for how far he wants to take this thing. Okay, A lot of times when you, uh, when you read about things or when you see us recite creeds or something, uh, you'll see church is sometimes in a small C with a, a lowercase C, sometimes with, it's with a capital C. And when you see church with a, with a lowercase C, that's a local congregation. That's probably what that's referring to. But when you see church with a capital C, that's when you're thinking about, no, 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 it's not just one local congregation. It's certainly not just a church building. It's the gathering of all Christians everywhere. All right? That kingdom of God, the church that is worldwide, 
all over. Uh, and actually, very early on in Christianity, they started to call that the Catholic Church because the word Catholic means universal. And in one of our creeds, we say, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And it's not like we're Catholic in here. A lot of people here are former Catholics, uh, but we're not Catholic here in, in the sense that what you think of Catholic, but we are Catholic in that we are part of this universal, worldwide Church of Jesus Christ that's everywhere around the world. And in our new sermon series, we're going to be looking at um, how God established the church, capital C, the worldwide congregation, the worldwide group of people who all follow Jesus. And so I don't know, if I asked you, why do you think uh, the church exists? What is the purpose of the church? If I were to ask you, what is a church? What is the church, uh, capital C? Why does it exist? Well, I think if you ask that to, to people out there, you'd get a lot of different answers. Uh, for some people, the church is kind of like a club. Uh, it's a, it's not an exclusive club or anything. Some, some clubs are maybe more exclusive than others, but, um, what it is is a place where a group of people in a community gather to share each other's lives. They gather to share each other's lives. They bear each other's burdens. Uh, and that is not the primary reason that the church exists, but it is an important thing that the church does. A lot of people see the church as uh, a charity. It's a source for charity. If you are in need, um, they can. if people are in need, they can go to the church. The church will help you out. And that's definitely a part of what we do here. Even our church here has this uh, has a food pantry ministry. That is, that is a part of what we do here, but that is not the primary reason that God established the church either. Uh, a lot of people see the church as a school, uh, as a place where a place of learning, a place where people will learn Bible, a place where people will uh, learn Christian morality, and a place where heritage will be passed on from one generation to another. And that is that absolutely must happen. And in our church, that absolutely must happen. In your home, that absolutely must happen. If you love the Lord, and if you believe the Bible, if you want your uh, your family to live by Christian morals, and if you want them to be Christians, after you're gone, you have to pass that heritage on to the next generation. And I would say that the, the church in the United States has really dropped the ball on that. Uh, the passing on of, of Christian heritage from one generation to another, it's something that we're, um, we may be failing at more than we realize. But the church isn't primarily a school either. So what is it? What is the church? The church is all of these things, but it's much, much more. And if we lose sight of why God established the church then other things that we do will actually also lose meaning and purpose. If you don't know why God uh, established us, then uh, it won't be a very good place for people to gather and share each other's lives. If, if, if we lose, uh, the, the meaning, lose sight of the meaning of why God established us, then we're not going to do a whole lot of good charity. And if, if we lose sight of why God, uh, has, um, has, why God has established us, then we won't really have anything to pass on to the next generation. What churches are really, uh, churches are outposts for a kingdom. And in those outposts, we definitely do connect together as people. We give charity to those in need. We teach each other and we teach the next generation the things that we were taught. But we also have a message to advance. A message to advance. And that message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's start reading the in the New Testament book of Acts. Uh, it's actually called, the full name of the, of the book is called The Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. It was written by Luke, the beloved physician. He was a traveling companion of Paul. Uh, as such, he had access to the very first Christians, that first generation of Christians, that first generation of Christ followers. He ran into them everywhere he went. He saw apostles. He saw the apostle Paul. He himself was on the front lines of everywhere the gospel advanced, uh, where Paul took it. He was, uh, he, was, uh, he was a slave doctor. Most people don't realize this, but there's a very good chance that he was a slave. Just kind of the, 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 um, the nature of his name, it, it indicates that he may have actually belonged to somebody else. In that world, a lot of times a, a master would name a slave after himself. And there was a very common Roman name, Lucan, and a very common... Uh, name for a uh, nickname for a slave that was owned by Lucan would be Lucas, and so Lucas was the name of this doctor. And uh, you know, you think of very rich people or very powerful politicians today; they have their own doctor who follows them everywhere they go, their own kind of personal private physician. I think that that's there's a good chance that that's what Luke was for his master. He was a slave doctor, um, and that slave doctor or that master, excuse me, became a Christian. 
And when he became a Christian, he became very curious and he wanted to verify that what he was believing, what he was following, what he was, uh, uh, the way he was changing his life, his conversion was good and accurate and genuine. And so he sent his, uh, his most learned slave, probably, okay, if he's a doctor, he's probably his most learned slave. I want you to go with Paul and I want you to verify everything that I've been taught. I don't want to believe a lie. So I want you to go with Paul and I want you to find the eyewitnesses. And I want you to verify that all this happened. And so Luke went with Paul or with whoever and went all throughout probably Palestine first. And his gospel is the record of all the eyewitnesses that he interviewed. Good chance he met Mary, the mother of Jesus, and got her personal story. We have Mary's personal story about how she became pregnant through the Holy Spirit and gave birth to Jesus. We don't have that in any other gospel. We get it, we get it from, uh, from her, from her mouth to Luke's ears and his pen. And all the rest of the gospel of Luke is him going to those people. Who was there? Who saw it? I want to know. And he writes it all down. And then he sends it back to his master. And his master is named Theophilus. Theophilus, though, may not be his real name. Because Theophilus uh, means the one who loves God. The one who loves God. Theo is in theology. Philos is in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Dear, most excellent Theophilus. He calls him most excellent Theophilus because he's his master. Most excellent Theophilus. You, the one who loves God. This is what I found out. You sent me to verify. I verified. Here's the gospel of Luke. And then he's about to give us volume two. Volume two, the Acts of the Apostles. Let's start reading in verse one. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And I just want to come back and, uh, and define one more word for you here. Apostles. Apostles. In the, in the Gospel of Luke and in the other Gospels, we almost exclusively call them disciples. They're the disciples there. And when you get into Acts, they're the apostles. It's the same group of guys except for Judas and Paul. Paul wasn't in the, in the, he wasn't part of the 12 in the, in the Gospels, but he does become an apostle later on. So what is the difference? And a disciple, uh, a disciple is somebody who follows and learns. All right. So Jesus chose these 12 disciples and they followed him and they learned from him. And when you read about the disciples in the Gospels, a lot of times there's this group of 12, there's a group of 72, and then the multitude that you might all call disciples. But the 12 disciples are those ones that Jesus handpicked and said, I want you to follow me and I want you to learn from me. Because later on, he was going to send them out. And that's what an apostle is. It means a sent one, somebody who has been sent. So first of all, you follow Jesus, you learn from Jesus, and then Jesus says, okay, now I'm going to leave and I send you out. Go out, go out. You are now my apostles and you go with my authority. They've been upgraded and if we follow Jesus, at some point, we're, we're going to be upgraded to. At, at first in your Christian life, when you don't know very much, uh, it's very important for you to just stay rooted in the Word, stay, stay in prayer, learn as much about this man, Jesus, as you can. And at some point, it probably won't be very long, but at some point, he'll say, wait a second, now I want you to go. Now I want you to go. I want you to go somewhere. And it probably won't be as far as China or India or someplace like that, but I do need you to go somewhere. Go there with me, for me. Share my gospel when you get there. Let's keep reading. After his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them, to the apostles, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, that is John the Baptist, he baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. For you to perform the works of Jesus, it's important for you to be convinced. Okay? Uh, Jesus died for you on a cross, but he's alive. In our last sermon series from the Gospel of John, uh, John wrote because he wanted you to, be, to believe and to be convinced, just like John was, that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died but he's alive. That will form the basis for all you believe and all that you do. And it will be what gives you strength day to day to live this life of faith. Christ's resurrection is our hope and source of strength. 
So now, according to this passage, we know that he's about to send them out. We know that they're convinced about Jesus and his resurrection. We know that God has another special gift to give them too, to give us. The third person of the Trinity is about to come to the earth and fill the apostles. They'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They'll be submerged into the Holy Spirit. They'll be dripping wet with the Holy Spirit. God has never, ever wanted us to be alone. In the Old Testament, he gave them the temple and the tabernacle as a big symbol for them to know, here, here I am, I'm with you. And then Jesus walked among us. And then after Jesus left, now the Holy Spirit lives in all who believe. Believers are indwelled with the Holy Spirit to inform them, to teach them, and to empower them to serve. What's interesting, interesting to me, mostly, about the whole thing is that when Jesus came to earth, it was really without a lot of fanfare. Okay, He came, born of a virgin, born in a stable. It was a very, uh, very humble affair. There were very few people that knew. It was announced to, sh to the shepherds with, with great fanfare, but not to everybody. All right? It wasn't obvious to everybody. Um, it was really kind of a very humble coming. And at Christmas time, we always talk about the humble beginnings, the humble incarnation of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But just in a few days, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And he's going to come in an extremely dramatic way. Nobody is going to have any uh, doubt that God is doing something when the Holy Spirit comes. It's a much more dramatic entrance. Uh, but the disciples at this point have really no idea that that's going to happen. Uh, they're really not thinking about it very much. Uh, if, if, if Jesus comes and says, I'm leaving. Oh, but we're attached to you. We want you. We want to keep you. He says, no, 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 no. Somebody else is coming. Well, I don't want somebody else. I want you. You know, that's, that's kind of how I, I see their attitude. I, I don't want you, you to leave. I, I don't want somebody else to come. I want to have you. And Jesus says, no, no, no. This is the gift of God. It's the best thing. Let me go. And when I go, he's going to come. The comforter, this great empowerer, he's going to come. But they're still really in their old way of thinking. They're really still in their, in their old w uh, way of thinking. Look at verse 6 and, and they'll reflect it. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. The Jewish people during this time, uh, they really had a, a few hopes about the future. And those hopes are reflected in the question that the disciples just asked Jesus. Are you going to restore to the, the kingdom to Israel now? Now would be a good time. I mean, he's just resurrected. He's shown that he's invincible. He'll be able to prove to everyone that he's the Messiah. No time like the present. And that's just what the Jewish people wanted then. And it's what they want now, at least the, the ultra-Orthodox do. They want the Messiah to come and reestablish their nation as a kingdom with a temple and everything right there and put David's descendant back on the throne. That's what they want. That's what they want. They wanted independence from Rome. They wanted the Gentiles, and Gentiles are anybody who's not Jewish. Okay, They had a nice word for, uh, for anybody who's not like them. Okay, There's us and not us. All right, uh, There's Jews and there's Gentiles. Okay. And probably everybody in here, we're all Gentiles. Who's Gentile here? Gentile and proud. All right, Gentiles. They wanted all the Gentiles to be either subjugated or converted. Okay, All those people who are not us, either defeat them and destroy them and kill them all off, or make them just like us. Whichever way you want, God, it's fine with us. Okay? And I, I think that a lot of us have that same idea too. All right? All these people in the world who are causing us so much, so much grief and making us pull our hair out, aren't we all just kind of looking to God and saying, hey, God, we need you to come back. We need you to reestablish everything. Just give us all a clean slate. Um, we need you ruling over everything so it'll all be done righteously. And all those people that are giving us grief, I want you to either convert them or destroy them. That's what I want. And Jesus looks at him and says, look, it's none of your business. It's not for you to know. And the thing is, he didn't say, no, no, you're completely wrong. He said, it's none of your business. And the fact is, what their hopes for the future were are kind of our hopes for the future. Don't you want Jesus to come back and set everything right? Aren't you uh, finished with all the, aren't you just done with all the foolishness that we see in our world today, don't you see immorality running rampant and you just want God to come back and say, hey, would you come back and tell everybody how they're supposed to be living? Because they're not believing us. They don't believe your book. Every, everything that you've told us, how you've told us to live, you've told us and nobody's doing it. Will you please come back and set things right? Will you please get rid of the, all these people uh, who are uh, giving us all this grief? 
We're fed up. Aren't you fed up? How much can you stomach? We don't even see all that's going on. Lord, you see it all. But Jesus gives them that unsatisfying answer. Remember, you know, with your little kids and everything, when they ask you all these questions, you say, I'll tell you when you're older. I'll tell you when you're older. I'll tell you when you're older. And Jesus says, I'm not going to tell you at all. Ouch. But make no mistake. Jesus does want to establish his kingdom on earth. Not so that they can be as this sort of independent, uh, sovereign nation themselves. No, uh, God's kingdom is a monarchy ruled by him, a very most, a most benevolent, kind king, a righteous king, a king who died for all of his subjects. Whatever, what other king ever did that? But he is setting up a kingdom on earth. And Jesus has, and, uh, and through his church, he does want the Gentiles to be converted. Here we all are, Gentiles. In our former pagan ways, we would have denied him. But the gospel message came to us. Somehow, the church starts out in Jerusalem, spreads all over Europe, and guess what? Eventually came to our ancestors. And most of us here, I don't know who, who all of us are here in our DNA, but most of us probably have a little bit at least of Northern European in us. And the gospel got to us. And guess what? The Gentiles were converted. The Gentiles have seen a great light. And we know that our former ways were wrong. And we've been given uh, this new life. And here in verse 8, Jesus is about to lay out the mission and vision of the church. All right? So what he tells the, uh, the disciples there is, I want you to stop. Stop thinking the way that you're thinking. There's something bigger, and I'm about to tell you what it is. All right? So listen up. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So the gospel, the church, the knowledge of Jesus Christ himself is to be spread to every inch of the globe. They get surprised all the time in the book of Acts at all the barriers and boundaries that God breaks through. And if you get involved in what God is doing in the world, guess what? I have a feeling you'll be shocked as well at where the gospel can go and what the gospel can do. And the primary method for us to get that gospel out to every inch of the, of the earth is for ordinary people to share the gospel with ordinary people. And where is this supposed to happen? Well, in Judea. First of all, in Judea, a lot of scholars will interpret that as your local area. Wherever you live, that's your Jerusalem. Okay, so for us, all of us here kind of are connected somehow to a Gardner community. All right, either here or just one of the towns that are kind of close by. That is our Jerusalem. And that is where uh, God has placed this local congregation to first and foremost share his love in the gospel of Jesus Christ to everybody here. Not an ear in Gardner should, should die or nobody should die without hearing this gospel right here because there's an outpost there's a, there's, a, there's a source of the good news. And this is the church. And there are other churches around here too that want to do the same thing. And so we're supposed to be gospel proclaimers right here in, all, in our Jerusalem, our local area. But not just here. Judea also. What is Judea? Okay, past Jerusalem, you have to go out to Judea. And Judea, I would say, is probably uh, more like our state. Okay, uh, Jerusalem is you, you, your locality and your people. Judea is more like not your locality, but still your people. Okay, uh, if you were a person in Jerusalem and, and somebody mentioned Judea, you'd say, well, I'm not from all of Judea, but uh, those are my people. I, I share a connection with all those people. And so I would say that uh, Maine, uh, that is our Judea, at least from, say, Brunswick to Bangor. When you say, okay, Brunswick to Bangor, here we are. This is our Judea. You get down to Portland, oh, they're so different down there. You get up to the county, well, they're very different. Maybe even down east, they're very different over there, okay? But from, uh, say, from Brunswick to Bangor, that's our people, right? But not, I'm from Oklahoma. But it's, you know, and, I, and apparently I'll never be a Mainer, apparently, since I wasn't born here, and my parents weren't born here. But um, from Bun Brunswick to Bangor, there's your Judea. There's your, your Judea. Not your locality, but certainly still your people. And in that area, not an ear that hasn't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then after that, we go down to Samaria. Samaria. 
What's Samaria? Well, that's Massachusetts and New York. Okay? Uh, they aren't your people, and you don't like them very much. And you're supposed to cross a boundary and get over yourself and go share the gospel with them anyway. From Oklahoma, we would say that that's Texas. Okay? You can always tell a Texan, but you can't tell them much. This is what we say in Oklahoma. Hey, we got some Texans over here. Yeah, that's right. We got some Texans. And in Texas, they say that's Oklahoma. I guess. We've got a good football rivalry. Uh, and, and it spills over into other parts of life as well. Um, but everybody's got a group of people that they're not them and they're not in their locality, but they're close enough to cause you grief. They're close enough that you don't like them. And you've got to get over yourself and get the gospel to those people. And then there's this other thing, to the ends of the earth. And that's people that's so far away that you don't even have a prejudice against them. I like to think of them as being people from Uruguay. How many of you have a rabid prejudice against people from Uruguay? Any Uruguayans here? How many of you couldn't even find it on the map? Do you know any ethnic stereotypes about Uruguayans? Neither do I. I've actually been there. I liked it. It's a very nice place. God, from a long time ago, has said, I want you to get that gospel everywhere. Your people, not your people, to people you've never even heard of. Get the gospel out there to them. And it's not a New Testament idea. It's an Old Testament idea too. Habakkuk 2.14 for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. No land and no people are to be left untouched by the gospel of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And it should never surprise us that God's vision for what he wants to do is grander than ours. Most of us, when you, know, when you think about starting a church and you start about thinking about how we're going to be a blessing to this area, you probably never start, you probably never start a church in Maine thinking of Uruguay. But God does. He starts a church everywhere, thinking of everywhere. And God's vision is much bigger than ours. And we have to sit back and say, okay, God, help us not to stifle or to hold you back in what you're trying to do in the world. The church I grew up in, um, when I started going there in the early 90s, was run, running about 250 in a sanctuary that was built to seat about 200 they were bringing in folding chairs, and they had two services. I mean, it was, it was tight in there, and they started this fundraising campaign, this building campaign. They bought some property, um, and they started building a sanctuary. And they, and they got together one night, and they said, all right, we need to start planning sort of what we want for the building. How many people do we want the sanctuary to be able to, to hold? And old brother Testerman, God rest his soul, piped up and said, build it for a thousand. Everybody said, okay, that's great, all right. How many do we want to build this, this for? Remember, we've got two services, so however big it is, you know, we've got two, we do two services, we can, just, we can just keep doing two services. They ended up building a sanctuary that seated 300, okay? Uh, so they're running 250 right now. They're running 250 right now in two services. So that's 125 in each service, all right? Uh, so they built a sanctuary that would hold 300, which is twice the size of the sanctuary, really, that they've got now. Now, plus they've got two services. Who would expect for a church to, to, to burst from 250 to 600 in, in a very short order of time? But guess what happened? That's exactly what happened. They moved into a new building and immediately had space issues. Oh, my goodness. They, uh, and, and, part of this is, and part of this isn't just the Oklahoma's God's country or anything. The town where we were living was ex experiencing a huge boom itself. So there was a lot of sociology going along with all this missiology of God. But the moment they moved, immediately they still had the same problem that they had in their old building. We don't have enough space. Ouch. Even in two services with a sanctuary that seated 300 people, they still started having... Uh, having having uh, space issues. And so, guess what they did? They did a third service in the gym. Uh, and the pastor had to preach three times on a Sunday morning and he went from the sanctuary to the gym and then back to the sanctuary. And it was exhausting. And then finally, at a certain point, they said, okay, let's start knocking some walls out. And let's stop doubting <laughs> 
what God will do. And if they had listened to old brother Testerman and built the sanctuary for a thousand, they'd be okay today. They'd be okay today. They're running about a thousand right now. And in two services, hey, they'd still have a lot of room to grow. Still have a lot of room to grow. Um, and probably have saved some money along the way because they didn't have to do a, another building campaign after they just did a building campaign. God's plans are bigger. God's plans for this church are bigger than our plans. God's plan for your life is bigger than your plan for your life. And that's why it should always be easy for a Christian to lay their plans and dreams at the foot of the cross and say, okay, Lord, now what would you have me do? I'm done with my own plans. What would you have me do? Because he doesn't call people to lesser lives, but to greater lives. And we limit God a lot of times, if that's possible, uh, much more than he limits us. A lot of people think, oh, God's going to put a cramp in my style. God's going to limit me in what I can do in life. No, you're going to limit him much more than he's going to limit you. And then Jesus ascended. A glorious moment, a sad moment. He left. But he won't leave us alone and without promise. Look at verse 10. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. But for now, we're to keep living the life of faith. We're to enjoy his presence with us in the form of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We're to carry out his great commission for us. And we're to make sure that the gospel is being preached in every corner of our own lives, every corner of our community, and every corner of the globe. We tend to compartmentalize our life. Uh, do, do you compartmentalize your life? You have your home life, your work life, your school life, your church life, your act other activities. Do you do that? And we're, then we're surprised often to see people out of place. If your boss walked in here this morning, would you say, oh, hey, how are you doing? You don't, you don't belong here. Is that what you would do? Do you remember when your parents showed up at school? Oh, hey, look, you're at school. You're never here at school. Why are you at school? You're shocked and you're worried that they're going to embarrass you. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? If your pastor comes to your home, don't you run around frantically hiding things? If a church member came to my home, I think I would probably say, okay, okay, well, wait, 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 wait. no, I probably wouldn't. Yeah, maybe I would. Are you afraid that Jesus will show up somewhere that you didn't expect him? Have you compartmentalized him to your church life? What if he showed up at your work life? What if he showed up at your school life? What if he showed up with your other activities? Would he be a drag? Would he embarrass you? Jesus wants to be in every compartment. He doesn't necessarily want you to close every compartment. He may. But really wants to, he wants to be his Lord over every compartment of your life. And if he is, he'll bring life to every compartment of your life. It won't always be comfortable, but it will be better. And he wants you to take the gospel from your church compartment to your home compartment. He wants you to take the gospel to your work compartment, to your school compartment, and to your activities compartment. Those are your Jerusalems, your Judeas, your Samarias, and your uttermost parts. And we as a church need to be doing mission and blessing, and charity, and gospel comp uh, proclamation in all of those compartments as well. We need to be a blessing and a point of gospel pro proclamation right here in Gardner. And we need to be a blessing and a ministry and a point of gospel proclamation in all the state of Maine and New England. And we need to be a blessing to those we'll never meet. We need to be a source of blessing to the people of Dagestan and Jilin, did you know that? Did you know that we, we help, uh, we help the, the gospel go forth in a place called Dagestan and in a place called Jilin? And uh, not to, uh, maybe tomorrow was it, that Esther said, her grandson is going to start a, a mission trip to India and we help fund him. And so this church right here, we're taking, we're taking, helping take the gospel to another compartment. India's got a lot of Christians, got a lot of missionaries there. We're sending one of them. Some of the people that we support here are Bible translators. Another family is going to China to do some very exciting work there. And we need to be in prayer for them. We need to financially support their work. 
We need to learn about those places so that we'll know a little bit more about what God is doing in our world. I mean, how many of us could really find Dagestan on a map? I'm not sure I could. The mission is laid out. Jesus said it. The gospel message to every inch of the globe. And we are the gospel proclaimers. The vision is laid out. Not a single ear that hasn't heard. That's why the church exists. And that's why this and every local congregation exists. Let's be a part of what God is doing. All throughout the book of Acts, the believers were shocked as they saw all that God was doing around them in the world. Let's make sure that we are the same kind of tools in God's hands to do the same kind of gospel spreading. And if we are, I think we'll be shocked and surprised and delighted at everything that God wants to accomplish through us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your gospel. You came to this earth to die for sinners and you saved us. And you've empowered us. You've recreated us. And now you've made us apostles, sent ones, people to go out and tell everybody what you did for us and that he'll do the same thing for them. Lord, please make us eager tools in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.